talk with everyone with me. Uh, Catherine's well known for her work in uh, homotopy theory, algebraic topology, category theory, and then um, also well known for um, sort of applications in uh, neuroscience, uh, cancer biology, and material science. So I think she'll tell us today about some connections. Thank you very much. So it's a great pleasure to, to be here at Ohio State. It's my first time actually in Columbus. And uh, so I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin, so I hope you don't mind too much that there's a, from somebody from a rival Big Ten school. Who, uh, that was a very, very long time ago. So. so today I'm going to talk to you about some work I've been doing for the last uh, a little over four years now, uh, using topology to study problems in neuroscience. And the, the idea behind the work I'm going to describe today is that you know, when you're looking at neuroscience, this beautiful visualization that was done by somebody from the Blue Brain team they work with, you know, you're, you're trying to discern what sort of interesting complex structures might be hidden within this sort of thicket of neurons and connections between neurons. And there are all other kinds of cells in the brain as well, the microglia and astrocytes and all these guys. They're all there. It's an extremely complex structure. And somehow you want to do some kind of appropriate dimensionality reduction, find some nice mathematical representation of this extremely complex structure, so that you can try to say something interesting in particular about how the structure of the brain influences its function. And then how the, what the function of the brain in turn affects its structure. So that's what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. Now, as Matt pointed out, oh geez, this is a problem. <laughs> Uh-oh. Let's see. Do we have a computer person? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, as you can partially see here, <laughs> I have an alter ego who also talks about uh, pure topology, and you could talk about operas and fill an entire blackboard with all sorts of things like this. But um, that's not what it's going to be about today. Today's really going to be about maybe not such highly sophisticated algebraic topology, but we're going to get into some very interesting applications to complex domain of neuroscience. Is there a full slide? I don't know what's happening. Let's try one more slide and see what happens. That one works. Okay. Maybe the point is I need to push the button there. We'll see. Okay. So what I want to tell you about first is the particular model of the brain that we're going to be studying. So what we're going to tell you about is a certain digital reconstruction of the brain. So we, again, this is going to be already partially a reduction of the complexity of the system. So this visualization here is supposed to give you some idea of the complexity where you have different neurons that are communicating via, so that neurons communicate primarily by electrical signals that are transmitted actually using, using chemical transmissions of uh, the signals we're using chemical ions. And so your neuron has a cell body, the soma. There are inputs to the soma via what are called the dendrites. Those are your sort of inputs to the soma. Some of the information processing already happens in the dendrites. Then the soma will or won't fire an electrical charge, depending on what's coming through the dendrites. And then it emits something through the axon. So that's the output through the axon. And then the axon goes out and meets the dendrites of other neurons and then sends a signal further. And we see some of this complexity in this structure here with the cell bodies of the somas and various axons and dendrites and some of the connections between the two here. This is going to be a connection point between an axon and a dendrite, which is called a synapse. And that's where the chemical signal gets transmitted from one to the other. And I'm just going to push the button over here. Yeah, not great. Oh, well, so there's an idea that's hiding here. <laughs> and so I get to tell you what the idea is instead. So here, what we're interested in doing is but the ultimate goal, since we're humans and we're somewhat egocentric, we'd like to be able to understand our own brains, of course. We'd like to be able to understand the structure of our brain influences its function and so on. But the thing about human brains is that they have hundreds of billions of neurons, brain cells, that are connected by hundreds of trillions of synapses, these connection points between the axons and the dendrites. So this is like, this is enormous. This is really hard to deal with. On the other hand, if we think about a rat, so 
a rat brain is weighs about two grams, brain of a human is about 1.2 kilograms. So we're kind of talking about orders of magnitude here. And it's also orders of magnitude in terms of the numbers of neurons that you have. You have here, instead of hundreds of billions, you have hundreds of millions of neurons, and you have hundreds of billions of synapses rather than hundreds of trillions. So there's three orders of magnitude. And so that starts to be maybe something a little more manageable. And you think, well, you know, rat is obviously much less complex than a human. But on the other hand, if you look at the structure of the cortex, which is the thinking part of the brain, then it actually looks very similar in the sense that in each of them, you actually have six different layers of the cortex. And it's, it's structured actually quite similarly. And you have relatively similar, similar types of neurons and so on. So it's maybe not too bad to start with an easier problem as your sort of toy example or your warm up to try to make some sort of digital reconstruction of at least part of the brain of a rat. And that was what they've done at the Blue Brain Project, which is led by Henry Markram, and to try to make a good enough digital reconstruction of the brain of a rat, built in, you know, build its sort of architecture or structure, build into that its function so that you can see what happens with activity. I'm going to try something here for a second. What if, interesting. Let's try actually making this, ah. Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. okay. Well, now you see the, you can talk about the goal, yes. Whoops. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want it to sneak through by itself. Stop, okay. Yeah, the problem is I was going to use Adobe Reader and it crashed, so I have to use Preview, sorry. Um, so we're gonna build a model of the rat neocortex as biologically accurate as possible and try to analyze its structure and function. Okay, so what we want to do is to exploit the de degree of organization in the brain to solve what this is really, this is not just a big data problem, this is a huge data problem. Because in addition to the fact that we have, you know, as I said, hundreds of millions of neurons and hundreds of billions of synapses, you have all kinds of different molecules floating around, neuromodulators and, uh, I, I, I think we're okay now because I switched to another mode. I think we're going to be okay. But thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you should actually come down, I think, 15 minutes before the talk starts to try to get the slides right. In any case, we're going to try to solve this big data problem. But, and you, you think, well, if I wanted to actually build a digital model of the brain, there's so much that I need to measure. There's so much I need to know. And even after decades and decades of many neuroscientists, like doing lots of measurements in the wet lab, there's still very, there's still a lot we don't know. We, the, the, the part that, that they actually do know about how different neurons interact and so on is much smaller. It's like a set of measure zero in the set of everything that you actually need to know about the brain. So what are you gonna do? Well, it turns out the brain is actually extremely highly organized, and there's a lot of redundancy in how it's built. I mean, if you relied on one single neuron to remember how to do integration by parts, you'd be in big trouble. You wouldn't want to drink that beer on Friday evening, because you might knock out that neuron. So there's a lot of extra redundancy there. Memories are stored in many places. You have a lot of neurons that are cooperating to do things. And so that fact makes it actually possible to try to make some kind of digital reconstruction because you can extrapolate from the little bit of data you have to actually figure out how you can build some model of the brain. So, there we go. So now, let me talk to you a little bit more about the blue brain model itself. So as I said, if you look at the neocortex of either a rat or a human, it actually has six distinct layers. So here we've been looking at this, this is sort of the surface of the brain here, you're going in depth into the brain. It's sort of these six layers. This is layer five and six, are really the thickest layers. The types of neurons you find in these layers are very different. The way they're all wired together is varied a lot. So there are, there are connections between the layers as well. And so what they did was to make some sort of, they, they made a very complex algorithm to reconstruct on supercomputers part of what's called the somatosensory cortex of the brain. So if I were a rat, my somatosensory cortex would be roughly here. And yours is as well, actually, humans. So the somatosensory cortex is the part of the brain that's responsible for processing incoming sensory information, touch type information, which it goes from you know, the nerve endings in your fingers, for example, up through your thalamus, and the thalamus distributed further to the somatosensory cortex. 
where it might sort of continue for further processing or might go into the motor cortex to tell you to move your finger if you're touching something hot, that kind of thing. So anyway, this is part of the somatosensory cortex, and they wanted to take a big enough piece of the somatosensory cortex that would actually have some function. And so they took what they call a microcircuit. So it's like some kind of core sample of the somatosensory cortex, which they reconstructed, and they chose to be at the, uh, to model a 14-day-old rat. So a rat at age 14 days is just opening its eyes for the first time. So in some sense, this is the, the brain of an animal that hasn't yet had much contact or some, with the real world. It hasn't really left the nest yet with its mother. Once they built it, they actually integrated the electrophysiology as well so that you can simulate both what's called spontaneous and evoked activity. So let me just explain quickly the difference between these two. So spontaneous activity is what's going on when your neurons are just sort of firing in a random way. So even when there's no incoming sensory information, so if you're in one of these sensory deprivation tanks, for example, you, your brain is still firing. It always, the little signals going off here and there, it's the way your brain stays ready to accept incoming information. If your brain were completely asleep and out when there was no incoming sensory information, if it suddenly received information, it has to wake up and start moving. So there's always some activity going on. That's a spontaneous activity. Evoked activity is the reaction of the neurons to some incoming stimulus. And so you can simulate both of these things in this model. So here's some details of the reconstruction. What did they take into account when they built this? So, you know, 12, 15 years ago, when they first started working on this, there were five little 14-day-old rats who were sacrificed. And there certain properties of their somatosensory cortices were measured. The thicknesses of the different layers, what kinds of, the, so they know what kinds of different cells should be there, look at the proportions of them, their densities, and so on. So there, relatively few biological parameters that were measured, but they were measured for five different rats. They're all of the same species, all the same age. They were all male, in fact. So I have those dead data. And then when they made this, uh, this reconstruction, so they want to take into account the precise shapes of the neurons. So I'll show you in a moment that the shapes of neurons can vary quite a lot. And there, what they had, they have 55 different shape types or morphological types of neurons that they built into this. And they wanted just not particular types, but they wanted actual, very precise shapes of the neurons. And then once they sort of placed these precisely shaped neurons in the network, then they figured out how to connect them. So if you're going to connect two neurons, there's going to be a synapse between them. The axon of one has to come within three microns of the dendrite of another. And then there's the possibility of having a connection. But if every time you had an axon and a dendrite that close to each other, there was a synapse, there would be too many. Your brain would be overconnected, and you would be completely autistic or, or, or something like this. So you need also to prune away all the extra connections. So there's a very, a very um, four-step algorithm for pruning this away. And there are various organizing principles that the neuroscientists have decided were important for how neurons should be connected together. So in the end, what did they do? So they have these five different rats. And because there are highly stochastic elements in this reconstruction algorithm, they actually made seven different instantiations. So they ran the algorithm seven times for each set of, uh, of uh, input parameters. They also then had a family of sort of average input parameters and then made seven different instantiations, seven different applications of the algorithm for these average parameters as well. So in the end, you have 42 of what these microcircuits. Each one has roughly 31,000 neurons, and it's, not, it's relatively sparsely connected. There are only 8 million connections among these 31,000 neurons. So it's less than 1% connectivity. And, and as you see here, I wrote roughly 8 million connections consisting of roughly 37 million synapses. So the synapses are these touch points between axons and dendrites. But the point is to have a reliable connection, one that you expect to be able to transmit a signal from one neuron to another, you actually need several synapses. So a connection, a, a secure connection between two neurons is made up of usually on the order of five or six synapses at the least. And so that's, that is what they constructed using uh, IBM supercomputers. So, then you can say, well, okay, so you've built in a lot of biology when making this reconstruction. How do you know that what you built is some, a reasonable approximation of reality? You have to validate it. And so how did they validate it? Well, there were various types of biological information that they hadn't built into the network. 
that were but built into that was a lot of local information about what happens, how do, how do different pairs of cells connect and things like this. And, but there was global information that came from in vitro and in vivo experiments that the neuroscientists had done in wet labs. And what they found is they could run in silico versions of those experiments and they were able to reproduce these experiments to within a reasonable degree of error, which, you know, biology is a very noisy subject. So, you know, it's not bad. If you're interested in learning more about this, there's a fantastic resource online called the Blue Brain Portal, where there are tons of things that you can download for free and explore, and you can get all the adjacency matrices that describe all these microcircuits. All of this is freely available to play with. And it's uh, a very, very nice resource. It is open to the public. Okay, so this is just to give you some idea of the complexity and the, the, the variability of these different types of cells. So these are pyramidal cells. There are two types of cells, in the, uh, two major types of cells in the brain. There are what are called excitatory and inhibitory. The excitatory ones are obviously there to turn, you know, amplify things. The inhibitory ones are like to tune it down. Pyram pyramidal cells are the excitatory ones and there's quite a lot of variability. This is going from layer two to layer six and you see that there are various sizes and some of the things point downward. So this is just giving some hint of the morphological complexity. So to just briefly summarize where this circuit is coming from. So you have all these different morphological types and what they did in order to have enough diversity because nature thrives on diversity because there aren't really enough examples of most types of cells that have been actually sort of studied in the lab. They had to do a, a little bit of, of tweaking of the num things to, to clone them to get enough diversity of the different types of, of neurons. Then they take an empty circuit and start by some sort of Poisson point process, placing the various neurons inside the circuit, then figuring out their connectivity based on their precise morphologies and these precise connectivities. Once they have the anatomy, so we've done the architecture now, but we don't want just anatomy, we want function. So we have to get into the physiology, and then they include the electrical diversity of the types of neurons. So even if you have neurons that have the same morphologies of the same shape they can have different electrical behavior so this is the sort of thing that's measured in the lab where they take a little probe and uh, like a glass pipette and you can you can uh, feed current into a neuron directly and see how it reacts to that current and so you can have a same the same morphological type of neuron can react in many different ways to an incoming current like that Synapses can also vary quite a lot in terms of how they behave, in terms of how reliable they are, in terms of how strong the reaction is, and so on. So they included that kind of diversity as well. And in the end, you have sort of a, a virtual piece of cortical tissue which, in which you can simulate activity. So you can have a stimulus like it's coming from the thalamus that you can run through there. Okay. So you've got this very, very complex model that you can build and you can play with. And this is where the topologists can come in because once all the, the computer scientists and neuroscientists have done the hard work of building this thing, then we can start explaining with it. So what's the point of building this thing? Uh, the idea is that, or the motivation for this was that even after, as I said, decades of work on the part of the neuroscientists, people have ideas about how little pieces of the brain work and the, the, the and they have some ideas about how all of this is integrated from the micro level of the neurons through the meso level of sort of groups of neurons working together to the level of brain regions and so on, the sort of thing you can measure on fMRI. But there's really, it's very, there are lots of pieces missing in the puzzle. So the idea is like, okay, let's just take the data we have, build something and see how it works. And so what you wanna see is what kind of properties emerge from this information you get in. So you put in all of this local information about how specific pair, types of pairs of neurons connect and things like that. You say, what kind of global structure and function emerges from this? So in particular, one thing that the, the graduate students who were there at lunch know, we talk about the effect of calcium concentration on network dynamics. So one of the parameters they can play with for function is the uh, concentration of calcium in the cerebrospinal fluid. And that has an influence on the function in the following way. This is not something that was built into the circuit, it was something that emerged as a property of the global circuit, which is that when you have a very low calcium concentration and you look at what's going on spontaneously, the, the neurons are just sort of firing in a lackadaisical, unordered kind of way. If the calcium concentration is very high, you have all the neurons that are sort of firing together 
in a very organized way. Too organized for anything interesting. Then there's a sort of sweet spot in between where you have some of this random firing going on and you also have some or neurons that are really coordinated and working together. And that seems to be really the, the sweet spot, as I said, for an ideal reaction to inputs, incoming stimuli. And that was something that emerged from this, from the local conditions that were built into the network. One long-term goal is to be able to use this sort of simulation to reduce the need for laboratory testing with animals. To be able to do drug discovery, drug testing uh, on, in, in, in silico like this, or to try to understand different brain diseases with these kind of in silico models. But we're not quite there yet. What I wanted to do, what we wanted to do, was to use the tools of algebraic topology to try to get, come up with some sort of nice dimension reduction, some mathematical representation that allows, enables us to describe both the structure and the function quantitatively in a common language and maybe understand something about how structure influences function. Why algebraic topology? Besides the fact that I'm an algebraic topologist, I have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So, more generally, what are we trying to do? We need to find an appropriate mathematical filter so that you, know, you, you look through some sort of polarized filter and you see only certain aspects of the story. So you're gonna hide some of the complexity and see only part of it. And what we're really interested in is thinking about things like connectivity, which is a reasonable thing to think about, and the emergence of global structure from local constraints. Well, if you think about algebraic topology, it's sort of, you know, it's sort of like graph theory on steroids in the sense that graph theory is all about graphs, obviously, sort of uh, one, two-dimensional things, if you'd like. And graph theory had already been, ever since uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, it, there were two neuroscientists on the opposite sides of the Atlantic who discovered roughly simultaneously that maybe graph theory would be a good thing to use to study what they called the connectome. They invented this word independently. So how the brain is connected, either on the level of the neurons or the level of brain regions and so on. And so they used, they and many other neuroscientists have now used graph theory for many years to study the brain and they look at all sorts of, like is it small world, is it, you know, all these kind of graph theory kind of things. But if you think about, you know, let's try to move it out, move out of flatland and start thinking about higher dimensional structures, think about algebraic topology. And topology is great for thinking about notions of being near something, proximity, connectivity, of course, and local to global, right? So algebraic topology is often about thinking about global phenomena uh, emerging from local conditions. So maybe it seems like it, it's a reasonable thing to try. Now, if we're thinking about the connections between two neurons, so here we have two somas, there's one and the other, and we think, of the, look at these lighted points here. These are supposed to represent synapses, so the connection between the axons and the dendrites, again, with some sort of electrical signal passing. Now, the thing about these synapses is they actually like valves. The chemical signal flows from the axon to the dendrite. There are other kinds of connections, they're called gap junctions, where signal can flow back and forth, but we're gonna focus on these chemical synapses, and they really do just act like valves. There, there's a definite sense of direction to the flow of information. So what are we gonna do to come up with a recent reasonable mathematical representation? We're gonna look at this thing as a directed graph, a diagraph, where the vertices correspond to the neurons, and then all our connections are directed. So we have directed edges between the, between the nodes that will represent these directed connections. So what are the tools we're gonna to use for this kind of topological representation? The idea is we wanna end up with some sort of representation like this of that beautifully complex picture of neurons in there. <coughs> so we're gonna do, we're gonna, you look at what are called, they're called directed simplices or they're also called directed clicks. So we're looking for specific, what neuroscientists call motifs within this directed network of neurons and their connections. So we want to pick out specific, interesting subgraphs of this graph. And the kind of subgraphs we're going to focus on are ones that are like higher dimensional versions of directed edges. We want to look at subgraphs that have a source and a sink and then a well-defined sense of the flow of information from the source to the sink. So you want all of these neurons to be working together to transmit the information. 
And we're going to do this in larger and larger families. We just start with one neuron by itself. It's a zero-dimensional object. It's a point. We think of that as a zero simplex. If we think of a connection between a source neuron and a sink neuron, then that's going to be a directed one simplex, just a one-dimensional edge like that. And we can move into higher dimensions. Here we have our source neuron and our sink neuron. And we see when we have three neurons here, it's creating a two-dimensional structure with this triangle. We again have a well-defined sense of direction from the source to the sink, like this. Or in three dimensions, now we have a tetrahedron defined by four neurons. And again, we have a source and a sink. And every face of this tetrahedron, every triangle, also has a source and a sink. So at every point, we, have, we know exactly where we should be going. There's a well-defined sense of direction from source to sink. And so these are sort of like, um, this is like a reinforcement of the way we can get from here to here. The, like the, high, the more neurons we have involved in this story, the more robust the connection is. Because if you just cut one of the edges, we still have many other ways we can get from the source to the sink. And so on, we can move up to four dimensions. And with a source and a sink, now we have five neurons and so on. So we're looking at these directed simplices, a directed N simplex is given by N plus one neurons that are all to all connected in this very directed way. Right? So the source and the sink, and every face, every subset has its own source and sink. So those are the specific motifs, the specific subgraphs we're going to look for in this large directed graph, which is given to us by the microcircuit. So let's do a little bit of math. What we're going to do is start with this directed graph, which is given by some set of vertices, some set of edges, and a function that associates to every edge its starting point, its source, and its ending point, its sink. So we need, this is, yes? So you don't have loops? No loops. So you know, we never, in, at least in this reconstruction, there are no neurons that connect to themselves. You know, so we have cycles. Cycles. Yeah, we have cycles. But for the time being, what we're looking at are these directed, we're just looking at these specific motifs, which are our building blocks. And then with these building blocks, we can build more complex structures, like cycles. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But for the time being, we're just starting with some directed graph. And we're going to associate to it an ordered simplicial complex, which is a little variant on the usual notion of simplicial complex, which is now going to be a collection of ordered sets, totally ordered sets satisfying the usual simplicial complex condition that any subset or ordered subset is also a simplex. So we're going to build a, one of these ordered simplicial complexes. The zero simplices will be the vertices. And the n simplices will given, be given by lists of n plus 1 vertices. So that every ordered pair is the source and sink of some edge. So this is an all-to-all -all connected set of vertices in this directed sense. And so this is a directed n plus one clique. So a clique in general in a graph is an all to all connected subgraph. But here we have this extra direction condition. So we call these directed n plus one cliques. There are alternative ways to think about these things. So they are in particular the acyclic cliques. So they're the all to all connected subgraphs with no cycles. You have an all to all connected subgraph with no cycles. It is precisely one of these guys. Or another way to say it is it's the cliques, so that if you look at every sub clique has a unique source. So we have these various ways of understanding this, and these were illustrated previously. Okay, so we, we can build up a simplicial complex like this, or an ordered simplicial complex. And once we have an ordered simplicial complex, we can actually realize it as a topological space and compute topological invariance of this structure. So here's an example of the sort of thing we can compute. So let's focus, for example, on this directed graph number two. So if we look at the path, the three here, I want to point out that we have reciprocal edges. <coughs> we can go from one to three and from three to one. This is entirely allowed. This is very different from what we usually see in simplicial complexes. But this sort of thing arises within the microcircuit. You can have two neurons that are connected from A to B and from B to A. And so we have to take this sort of thing into account. And when we do, if we look at the clique that's given by one, four, three, and then this upper edge from one to three, so the, then that is one of these directed two simplices because we have a source, number one, we have a sink, number three, and we have this well-defined sense of flow of information. These things are totally ordered. 
On the other hand, if we look at one, four, three with the lower edge from three to one now, now this is going to be a cycle. We can go around and around and around. There's no, there's no source and sink. So that one doesn't give us a two simplex. So if we were going to look at a topological space that was associated with this, we could fill in this upper one with a solid triangle and the lower one we would not. So it looks like a solid triangle with a little extra handle on it. Similarly here in example number three, if we look at the clique that's given by one, two, and four, this one is a directed simplex. You have a source, you have a sink, a well-defined sense of direction. That is going to give you a two simplex, a solid triangle. On the other hand, this one, three, two, four, this is another cycle, so it doesn't get filled in. So in this way, we can associate to a directed graph an actual topological space, and we can start computing topological invariance. But, we can also build more complex structures. So we're not just thinking about the simple, the simple are our building blocks, and then we can build more complex structures from these building blocks. So if you are a child with a set of building blocks, then you know, you're not, you don't just leave the blocks like this, you start building complex things. You build a castle, for example. And what are the distinguishing features of a castle? It's things like the windows and the rooms, <clears throat> different kinds of cavities that you build. And so you can build a window, for example, with these uh, one simplices. And so this is not, this doesn't give you anything about two simplices, it's just a collection of one simplices that are sort of glued together. And that gives you a cavity in your structure. And you can build the same kind of thing as something analogous with two simplices. If you take eight different two simplices and you glue them along their faces like this, what you end up with is some model of a two sphere that's built like this. This is hollow on the inside. And that's a sort of a two dimensional cavity. And so for topologists, of course, I'm talking about one and two dimensional homology classes. Um, but we can just think about it in this very geometric way as well. And these are sort of interesting structures within the network that we can build with these, spe these special motifs, these special subgraphs, which are the directed simplices. Okay, so that's how we're going to represent topologically what's going on in this, in this network. So the idea is, you know, when I arrived in Columbus and I wanted to figure out how to get from my hotel to campus yesterday morning. Well, Google Maps sent me right into a construction area, but, um, <laughs> but I mean, the, um, the point for me was not to know who lived on the third floor apartment here and what store was at the, you know, in this place and so on. I just need to know what roads would get me from one place to another. And that's the same kind of thing we're going to do here with this dimension reduction. We don't care for the moment about the identities of the different neurons and about their electrophysiology or anything like that. We just care who's connected to whom and how. And, how are, and what are the multiple paths to get from here to there. And that's what we're going to be counting now. So I'm going to tell you about the structural insights we get by looking at this kind of topological representation of this network of neurons. So we actually do have these directed simplices in the microcircuit. And what I want to illustrate here, these are showing actual locations of some of these simplices within the microcircuit. So if we look, for example, at a six dimensional simplex, so this has seven different neurons involved in it. They all live in layer six, and many of them are this kind called UTPC, untufted pyramidal cells. And so you see that there's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six and they would be all, all connected in this order like this. And so we are able to, by, you can actually figure out where, which simplices are there, where they are, which neurons are involved, their precise identities and so on. And there was, in this particular uh, microcircuit, there were 17 different six simplices, 854 or five simplices like they were of this form. So this one actually, this is, this is an interesting one because the, the source neuron is up here in layer two, three. Then we have two neurons, sorry, even four neurons, that are in layer four, different pyramidal cells in layer four, and then the sink is in layer five. So we have this sort of flow of information in this case from the upper layers to the deeper layers. And when we pointed this out, the neuroscientists that we were finding simplices like this, they thought that was really cool because they knew from web lab experiments that the flow of information in the brain of a rat at that age is sort of from the upper to the deeper layers. And we, we just detected that with these simplices. We didn't know that's what we were looking for. It just emerged from the way the local structure was put together. So now we're just going to start looking at what we can say about the structural complexity, the structural organization of the circuit using this notion of directed simplices. <clears throat> 
So here, what we have in this plot is along the x-axis, simplex dimension, which is always one less than the number of neurons involved, and the number of surfaces of that dimension. And notice that here it's 8 times 10 to the 7th. So 80 million is the number here. The blue curve here is the number of simplices, directed simplices, of these different dimensions that you find in the actual blue brain microcircuit. So if we look here, we see that we have roughly 75 million two simplices, roughly 63 million perhaps three simplices, again about 10 million four simplices. Then it looks like it goes to zero, but it doesn't actually, that's why there's this little blowout here. There's just a, a change of scale. And I keep thinking that I need to ask one of my postdocs or PhD students to do this on a logarithmic scale. So it's so up nicely. But anyway, this is, we, we have this sort of blowout here, and we can see dimensions four, five, four, five, six, and seven. And we see that we have even 4,006 simplices and even 187 simplices. So the neuroscientists were really surprised that you could have up to eight neurons that would be all to all connected in this directed way. So all working together to transmit the signal. And so this was like, okay, you need to, when you're doing something like this, you have to have some kind of comparison that you're making. You can't just simply say, these are the numbers, aren't they interesting? You have to compare it to something people can you know, have some idea about. So the first comparison that we did, the first null model that we looked at was an artist Renyi graph. So that can seem like pretty stupid. So what, what are we doing here? We're taking 31,000 vertices, because that's the size of our graph, and then putting edges in from A to B with a probability that was equal to the average connection probability in the actual microcircuit, which is about 0.8%. So with 0.8% probability, you would include an edge from A to B, but 0.8 probability, you could include an edge from B to A, and you do that for all the possible pairs of edges. And so you end up with some kind of random graph, and you look at what happens with the simplex counts, and you say, okay, yeah, you have something like 15 million two simplices, but then it dies out almost completely. There are no four simplices. This, is, this really is zero. And three is pretty damn close to zero as well. So it's considerably less structurally organized than the blue brain microcircuit. Let me just explain briefly what these other curves are. So that is talking about a less sophisticated biological model where you're not taking the precise morphologies into account, but sort of average morphologies and average connection probabilities. And when you do that, you're sort of looking at the neuron not so much as a very precise you know, three-dimensional geometric shape, but more like a probability density then again, you, so you, you get, it looks better, but it's already structurally much less complex than what you get in the real microcircuit that takes these precise morphologies into account. So this is some indication that we're picking up some structural complexity like this. Once we had seen these results in the reconstructed microcircuit, this was an example of one of these things that can send people back to the wet lab. They say, well, okay, can you actually find these things in a real, in actual tissue? So at DPFL, there's um, a scientist named Rodrigo Perrin, who's perhaps the world champion, which they call patch clamping. So in patch clamping, what you do is you take a piece of, of neural tissue, and then you take some of these uh, glass electrodes that you insert into the different neurons. And you can, he can do this up to 12 neurons at a time from a piece of rat neural tissue. And you feed current into one of them, and you see which other, which other ones react. And this is a way of figuring out how things are connected. And with that, they could figure out what the, the connectivity of up to 12 neurons was, and they started looking for uh, different directed syntheses. And you see that by just doing 55 experiments with 12 neurons, they already had over 252 syntheses, uh, almost 53 syntheses, and even some four syntheses. That's up to five neurons that are all, all connected in 12 randomly chosen neurons. So, it means these things actually do exist in real life. And then I went back and did in silico versions of the in vitro experiments. And you see that, yeah, indeed, if anything, we're underestimating the number of the simplices that you have. That once you get an even better uh, biological approximation, then you should actually have even more of these sorts of simplices. But that's just about structure. What we're really interested in is in function. You want to know how the brain is working. And so our, our hypothesis was that these, these directed simplices should be playing some sort of functional role. I said that you want to think of it as sort of thickened edges, more robust ways of transmitting signals from the source to the, to the sink. And that's what this graph is telling us actually happens. So I was just reading a paper by, <coughs> excuse me, 
I think people that I used to and Matt, <clears throat> and they were talking about edge click number, and that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about here, actually. So what we did was to look at every connected pair of neurons in the graph. So that's every directed edge there, and said, what is the maximal dimension of a simplex to which that edge belongs? It's a very natural question to ask. And you say, okay, that's what this number here is on the x-axis, the maximal dimension of a simplex to which a connection belongs. On the y-axis, we have the correlation in the spiking behavior of the neurons. So you're looking at the, how the neurons are reacting to an input stimulus, and so this produces what they call a spike train. So it's a time series of spiking behavior of the two neurons. And you can calculate correlation, Pearson correlation, for example, in the spiking behavior. And that's what we're measuring here, the correlation in the spiking behavior. Now, the dotted black line is saying what is the average correlation for any pair of connected neurons in the network. And it's about 0.3. Now, if we look at this red curve here, then we're looking at the correlation spiking behavior between the sync neuron of the simplex and the one just before it in the order. And what we see is that as the, the maximal dimension of the simplex to which the connection belongs increases, the correlation in spiking behavior also increases. The various colors here are looking at other kinds of connections from the source to right after the source, to the source to the sink, and so on. And in every case, we see that the correlation is increasing. And the correlation is highest for this pair here. We think it's because they have the most common input. We share the most common input there. So that's interesting to see that as it increases, the correlation increases. But this is also interesting to look at at this end. Because you think about what it means that the maximal dimension of a simplex to which an edge belongs is one, that means that edge lives all by itself. It's not part of anything bigger. It's just like a little hair somewhere in the circuit. And what this says is that if you have two connected neurons, but they're not part of any larger structure, their correlation is actually half of the average correlation of a pair of neurons in the circuit. Somehow, in order for there to be correlated behavior, they have to be part of a bigger structure. So these simplices actually do play an important functional role. Or they seem to. This is an indication that they do. Another indication is to look at how many simplices of this maximal dimension belong. So this is a very, very complex graph. So every edge belongs to thousands of different simplices. And you could say, okay, well, I'm interested in the maximal dimension of simplex to which the edge belongs. They say, how many of those does it belong to? And what these curves illustrate, for example, here, is that as the number of simplices to which an edge, uh, maximal simplices to which an edge belongs increases, the correlation also increases. So the more maximal simplices you belong to, the more correlated you are. And moreover, as the dimension increases, you need fewer and fewer simplices to attain sort of this maximal level of correlation. So this is another indication that these simplices are actually playing a functional role. Now, with what I've been talking to you about was their first publicly released draft of the microcircuit. But about two years ago, this has not yet been publicly released, but it's used within Bluebrain so far, they came up with another more refined version of the microcircuit with what they call better axons. So the axons are hard to reconstruct because they're very long and so on, and they have a better approximation now. And they've made other various improvements. And so what I want to show you here is what happens when you have this even better approximation. So the blue columns here are the simplex counts for this original column that I've been talking about, the first draft. And this really is a logarithmic scale here, which is what it should have been before. But in any case, so we have a logarithmic scale with these, with these blue things, and this is the, the version five circuit, the first publicly released circuit, and we see these counts. And we see that the largest dimension was six in this particular case. But with this new version, with the better axons and better biology, they even get up to nine. There are nine dimensional simplices. So these are these yellow columns here. This is the new circuit. But the green, that's really interesting. So the green, they actually managed to reconstruct the entire somatosensory cortex, not just one little microcircuit. The entire somatosensory cortex has 1.7 million neurons. And one question that people asked me when I was giving talks about this even a couple of years ago, they would say, okay, so you get six or seven simplices in one microcircuit. What's gonna happen when you take a bigger piece of the brain? Are you gonna get much larger simplices? Things like that. I didn't know, I guess. I said, yeah, probably. But 
so what we see here is that if we go from the one microcircuit in the somatosensory cortex with this better biology, we get nine syntheses. If we take the entire somatosensory cortex, we still get only nine syntheses. So somehow having a bigger structure doesn't seem to be giving you much larger simplicity. It could be that we still are not really capturing the biology because axons can be very, very, very long on the scale of the brain. So it could be that there are connections that we're missing and we actually will get some even higher dimensional simplicities, but it's interesting. This was completely unexpected. That when you go from 31,000 to 1.7 million, that the dimension doesn't really increase or doesn't increase. Now, <laughs> We also look to see what's happening in a much simpler animal than a rat. C. elegans is a nematode. It has roughly, well, 279 neurons. So, not very big. Enough to get around in its, in its very small life. But the thing about the nematode, the C. elegans, is that the entire connectivity of its brain is known. You know, every single connection. And so you can say, well, we can, we can apply these same techniques. We can look for the sim directed simplices. We can, do, we can even compute its homology, count the number of cavities. And if we do this, so the number of simplices in C. elegans, you see that it even, you know, little C. elegans has seven simplices. There are up to eight neurons that are coordinated there. So it's not surprising that in a rat, you have, you know, even higher dimensional simplices. So yeah, seven dimensional simplices on our friend the C. elegans. And the, the dotted green line here is a comparison with an Erdos Rendi. Same number of vertices, same connection probability. And you see, boom, it dies out very fast. So this is not random. And then here was the calculation of the Betty numbers, so the numbers of cavities. And you see that, you know, it has up to seven dimensional homology, this guy. It's a really complex network for a very stupid animal. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then here, these are the Betty numbers for the, for the Erdos Rennie, and I'm sure that Matt is not surprised to see that it looks like this. And you see that, yeah, there's really a lot of complex structure here, even for an animal as simple as the C. elegans. So this is um, an indication, that it's an interesting perspective on, the, on this structure. Um, right. And this is, this is one I've heard, yes? Um, so since the C. elegans is so simple, has anybody looked at what the function of these very high dimensional simplicities is? Not yet, no. So we're the only ones who's even, who have even counted them. So we need to, <laughs> we, it would be interesting to try. Yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide just for just a second? So the numbers on the top, that's the Betty numbers for C. elegans. The, 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 the blue, the, this brown curve is the Betty numbers, and, and the blue is the Irish Rennie, yeah. I'm sorry, colorblind. Just the numbers on the top. Oh, here. Curve, the these are these numbers of simplicity. These are the numbers of simplicity. Yeah, these are simplex ah, counts. Those numbers, um, those numbers are the Betty numbers. I see. So there's a lot of homology, a regional amount of homology, and several different. Yeah. Of it's really interesting. Yeah. Like that. Huh? Yeah. 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 Yeah
And so when we were first doing this, we couldn't calculate things like, like these numbers. They were way, way out of reach by the computational methods we had. So we were computing the Euler characteristic, which is just the alternating sum of the numbers of simplices, and Betty 5, which is the top homological dimension. And we noticed that, well, first we just did Euler characteristic by itself for the different rats and Betty 5 by itself for the different rats and saw that it was already, you know, it was doing a pretty good job in the sense that they were, they were clustering pretty nicely, but, you know, with some overlap. Then somebody had the idea of plotting Euler characteristic versus Betty 5. What a crazy thing to do. And it was almost clustering like this. It was very nice. Then got a new postdoc who was able to figure out how to compute these things, at least within a reasonable error, which to me was a crazy thing to try to do. But yes, you could compute this within a, a very reasonable error. You could compute these values you know, on the order of an error that's in the thousands when you're looking at millions. It's not bad. And then we could actually compute these things and, and cluster them. And you see that it just, it's a beautiful cluster. So uh, microcircuits that are coming from the same rat have similar topological structure. And if they have similar, you have microcircuits with similar topological structure as determined by these invariants, they come from the same rat. So this That's is pretty all amazing. The same species. They're all the same species, same age, same sex. So is this kind of, I mean, one thing that's surprising is the different uh, microcircuits or different parts of their brain have similar topology, but to me the other surprise is different rats have different topology. Yeah. I mean, maybe I would believe they're all clustered, but then I would think they're all in one place. But, but so that's what the thing. So that these few biological parameters that we're taking into account for the different rats actually do lead to different structure. This is pretty cool. Do you know that if it's adult rats, maybe some variation shrink? We don't know. We don't know. I would expect it to get larger, actually, because then you have the effect. This is this is nature. Then you have nurture that's coming into play. So, pretty cool, I think. So, a few minutes for functional insights. So it's not all about structure. It's also about function. So I'm afraid that because I had to switch to preview, we don't have a movie here. There should have been a movie showing a beautiful sort of tapestry of electrical activity moving across here. So they can show, you know, can really visualize what it looks like when activity is moving through here. And it's beautiful, but it's really hard to figure out like how can you quantify what's going on there. And so what we want to use is the same kind of topological language to quantify activity as well as structure. So what do we do? We look at either recorded or uh, sorry, spontaneous or evoked activity. And then we sort of bin it into appropriate time bins of, the, of, a, of, a, of a biologically reasonable size, turns out to be five milliseconds. And in each time bin, you look at the activity of the network at that time, and you figure out what subgraph of the directed graph is actually active. And you get a time series of subgraphs of your graph. And we're going to analyze that using the tools that we already introduced. So in order to determine what, which edges are really active, we use something called a transmission response rule, which was determined by a kind of a probabilistic analysis. It was sort of trying to guess at causality. Because when a neuron fires, because every neuron receives input from thousands of other neurons, it's not easy to say which neuron caused this one to fire. So you have to have some kind of guesstimate. And this was this transmission response rule. So what we decided was that you'll say that, a, that, that an edge is active. Well, it has to be there. It has to be a structural connection. So if the source neuron spikes in that interval and, this, and the sync neuron spikes at most 10 milliseconds after the other one. So this is just an approximation to causality. But it turns out to be, based on other experiments we've done, not a, not a bad approximation to causality. So we figure out for each time bin, what's the active subgraph. And so this is to give you some idea of what an active subgraph would look like. Here we're looking at the, the microcircuit and we're saying we're including the edges that are colored here. These are, the, these are our active edges. So if we zoom out for layer five, we have some of these white dots that represent neurons that are they're not active, so there's no connection, and other ones that are connected and these would be including these kinds of edges. And so we're analyzing this kind of subgraph. So we did a simulation where we had nine different stimuli that we input, each one of them 30 times, to see how the network reacted. So we have one of these, this is in this case of force simplex that we'd look at that was scattered across the different layers. And look how the neurons are reacting. So we have our 30 different trials that were measured along here. Each little black dot there is a spike of the neuron. This is time in this direction. And then you look at sort of the spiking behavior of the different neurons and you, from this you can build up the simplicity looking at your active edges and so on. <coughs> 
So this is the kind of setup that we had with these nine different stimuli, each one with 30 different trials. So in the end, we can get time series, since we have a time series of subgraphs, we can get a time series of various topological invariants. We could count like the number of, of uh, edges, the number of one cavities, the number of three cavities, the Euler characteristic over time. And so these are our nine different stimuli from sort of, these are the sort of most synchronous to the least synchronous and we get these various patterns. And it's like, yeah, okay, we can kind of see a difference between what's going on with these different stimuli according to these different topological invariants. But then because of our success with plotting things like Euler characteristic versus Betty Five, we said, well, what if we plot over time, you know, one of these, invariants, Betty 1, against another one, Betty 3. Just see what happens. But when you do that, you get a beautiful picture, I think. What we have, we call it the swoosh. <laughs> and I keep thinking I should get myself a t-shirt with this on it. But um, <laughs> So the idea here is that we're looking, we're plotting Betty 1, so the number of one cavities, against Betty 3, the number of three cavities. And this is time that's moving along here. So you can see 65 to 7. This is the time since the stimulus hit the circuit. And what you see is that there's a sort of an increasing complexity. You get more and more one cycles. And then just at the moment when you sort of hit the maximum number of one cycles, you have the number of three cycles that increases, 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 and until it just sort of dies out. So you have this sort of signature of information processing. And here we're seeing that for three of the different stimuli, it's kind of the same picture each time. They have kind of different amplitude, but it's the same kind of reverberant cycle that you get like this the way it's reacting to the input stimuli. You could also look at what happens for the various rats. So these are our five different rats with the same input stimulus each time. You see again, the same kind of signature with an increase in the number of one cycles and then, then as those die out, you have the number of three classes that just, and then all sort of dies away. And it's the same kind of pattern each time. And so we see this as kind of uh, the, the analogy that a metaphor would like to use is kind of like sandcastle on a beach. You're building a more and more complex sandcastle, and then the wave comes in and washes it away when the information processing is over. So you've got this, oops, more and more complex structures being built. And you can even see where the activity is in the microcircuit. And sometimes this is some sort of heat diagram that's showing where the centers of activity are. And you can see, you know, in the activity, when you're getting more and more of these three classes, you have a lot of intense activity in levels five and six, and then it, it all fades away. So you have this, with, you know, it's just for the time being more like a qualitative picture of this is one way we can use topology to reflect what's going on during information processing. So we're thinking about lots of other open questions as well. Right now we're thinking about plasticity. So the strength and reliability of synapses changes through time in reaction to input stimuli. And you want to see how that is affecting the circuit. So for the time being, we've been looking at the circuit as a graph where there either was or wasn't an edge. So it's a binary thing. But actually, these edges are really weighted. They're weighted by the, by the, the weights of these different synapses. And so we're analyzing these questions of plasticity by thinking about a weighted directed graph, which is giving us a filtered simplicial complex, and so we're using persistent homology instead of just homology to study this. And it turns out that this gives us a very nice way of quantifying the effect of plasticity and figuring out where the biggest changes are happening with plasticity. Also, we're thinking about directed topological spaces here. One, one, thing, one problem with what we've done so far is that when we look at this ordered simplicial complex associated directed graph, then we go, we, comp we compute its homology. And when you do that, you're forgetting the direction. And it turns out that this is, you know, we'd like to be able to retain this direction in a better way. We've looked at various invariants of directed topological spaces, and we haven't really found one that is both computable and really reflects the, the, the direction and therefore the dynamics of the network in a good way. So this is something, this is new theory that has to be developed. You can't work on a project like this without having a large team of collaborators with a wide variety of skills. Everything from pure algebraic topologists to computational topologists to, to computer scientists to neuroscientists and physicists and statisticians. And so it's a big team that work together to work to, to create this project. And some of the people that sit here are uh, working on new projects with us, having to do with plasticity and so on. And it's my pleasure to thank the whole team for working together on this project. <laughs>
and to thank you for your attention. Several times you compared to the Erdos Rainey graph, uh, and I'm wondering if there are if there's work in progress to try to come up with a different model of a random graph that would have closer structure, to, you know, in terms of Betty graphs, just like they did when they were trying to find a better model of small world phenomena. So, I mean, I was talking to to you two yesterday about maybe some sort of uh, maybe it was some kind of Erdos Rainey perturbation of a random geometric graph. I mean, that's one thing we can look into. Um, we have, we're not really pursuing it in that direction, but it would be interesting to see whether there is some other random kind of model that can describe it. But uh, we tried a few things and nothing was really fitting, but um, it would be interesting to see whether, whether one could. I suspect that you can't really. I suspect that their biology is really there in a very deep sense and that it's not going to be uh, as, it's not going to be so simple. I don't think it's really a, a random, it may be sort of, maybe a pseudo-random kind of thing that has occurred to me, but I haven't really pursued that. So, uh, one question. When, when you were looking at the windows for perhaps higher uh, polygons, mm -hmm. there are cycles or just uh, structures, uh, structures uh, are you converting the dimensional faces there to construct like polygons? No. Uh, so that's, that's another direction that could be interesting to pursue, which would be to look at, uh, instead of restricting this to simplices, to look at sort of directed polytopes. So there, there are, that is something that has occurred to us that we haven't done, but it could be interesting to do, certainly. Um, I guess because we're topologists, simplicities seem like a good thing to think about. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that we've talked about, looking at more directed polytopes rather than just simplices. Uh, yeah. You had that kind of the <laughs> simple situation of seeing elegant. Can you say anything about the fundamental group? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't think we tried to compute it. That's a really good idea. That's a really good idea. Yeah. And that should actually even be possible to do because it's not that big. So. Oh, great. I, that's a pro, I'll, I'll ask one of my. <laughs> I'll ask one of my PhD students to do that next week. <laughs> so in C. Elements, for example, you, you never talk about the incitatory or inhibitory right. at the beginning. Is it possible to distinguish between those cells and then the different sorts of biomarkers? So that's so it is possible in C. elegans they know which ones are excitatory and which ones are inhibitory. Um, it could be interesting to see whether. You know, if we look just at the excitatories, just at the inhibitories, whether that's a, sort of a different picture. So in terms of the, um, the blue brain microcircuit, so we did like look at what's going on with the excitatories and inhibitories. Notice that the large simplices, large dimensional simplices are constructed exclusively of excitatory neurons. The inhibitories appear only in small simplices. We looked at the subgraph only of excitatories and looked at the, like the profile of the simplex counts. And it's a bit lower, but it's basically the same shape if you just look at the excitatories. So um, we think we have because you, I mean, people say excitatories are global connections. Yeah, yeah it's, it's clear that here we're really seeing that the inhibitories are forming very, quite local connections. And that's, I think that's probably why they're part of these smaller dimensional simplex. But yeah. I was wondering whether there's some way, or maybe you already said this, um, to study like a whole lot of this essentially in the case that it might be mistakes. Right. So we have looked at like how many, what happens when you start throwing away connections. And it's quite robust. So it stays uh, quite stable for a while. And then there's a catastrophic drop off when you, I, I think. I don't remember where it was. I think it was easily up to 20 or 30% of the connections that you could start peeling away until it really collapsed. So, yeah. You, you mentioned on one of your slides that part of what made this possible um, was that you could compute homology approximately. Right. Um, so, and now you said when you're looking at plasticity and so on, you compute persistent homology. So do you have ways you're looking at of computing 
Yes, yes. In in the high, uh, so we can compute um, like Betty one, persistent Betty one exactly. But if we do persistent Betty two or three, then it's approximate. So I should mention that this is the, the software that used for this is called Flagser. So it's a, a built on Ripser by by Daniel Luke Hatman. It's it's uh, open access on GitHub. For anybody who wants to, to try to do these computations, it's, it's uh, powerful and fast to doing these computations. Last few slide you showed that once in, in response to the stimulation, some in the network, some neurons that didn't take part, mm -hmm. some neurons were stopped. And what is that parameter that decides which neuron group of neurons will not take part? So it, it's really, it's quite complex, right? So um, if you have if you have a stimulus that is not sufficiently synchronous, then it's not going to be enough of an input to the circuit to really get everybody excited. So um, it's hard. One reason why we were looking only at Betty two and Betty three in this context is that there are when we're looking at this time series of subgraphs, there are very few even four and five dimensional simplices that appear because that requires a lot of neurons to be, you know, they're connected, that the, the simplex is already there, and they all fire within very close times. And that's pretty unlikely unless you have a very powerful input. And so um, it's the, the, the partial difference, the system of partial differential equations that's controlling the firing behavior is neurons is really, really complex. And that's why they have to use even a supercomputer to do any of these simulations. So it's really, uh, to, you can't predict who is going to be firing. You can, you know, you may be able to guess if there's a one particularly well-connected neuron that's kind of a hub that maybe is going to be firing, but the other ones, yeah. I'm, I'm curious about the, the time series perhaps mm -hmm. you were showing, and I'm wondering how much uh, of the theory from the sort of time series analysis you brought to bear on those. Like, for example, if you try to model the lags that are in those graphs, or you know, fit some kind of stochastic uh, couple differential equations to explain those pictures you were making with the, the Betty one and Betty three. No, we haven't. We haven't. So we did a little bit of time series analysis at the beginning, trying to apply some of the. Even had a couple of uh, like master's students from statistics who were looking at this for us, and it didn't. We didn't pursue it very far because it, it wasn't really leading anywhere interesting, but it, it could be worth to go back now, now that we understand things better. Yeah, but there are lots of interesting open questions. Maybe one more question. Yeah, you know, like for a number of years, Den Dennis Sullivan was advertising his journey mm -hmm. of using algebraic topology to study TDD, uh, discretizing and stuff. And, you, know, like you mentioned the movie, and I, I haven't, you know, I mean, I think no one in the audience really took it too seriously, but it kind of makes me wonder if, if in your context here, that maybe some of these ideas yeah. could actually work out. No, that's a good point. So um, about a year and a half ago, I was at a conference and talked about some of this work, and Dennis was there. And you know, Dennis was also talking about this sort of discretized study of, I don't know if it was PDUs, but it was something. And uh, some, of the, some of the ideas that he was expressing did sound like, at some point, I think there may be a certain convergence. Yes. Yeah. Let's go.